We, we elementary school committee meeting calling to order at 4.03 p.m. Our first of the school year. And let's see. First thing on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes of our June 10th, 2021 meeting and our special meeting minutes from the Frontier Regional and Union 38 meeting that was with the Board of Health on August 28th. Do I hear a motion? I'll move to approve the minutes. And I will second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. And now we're on to Shelly with the financial statement. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Good to see you again. Okay. Uh, so I did email out the financial reports. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Um, and I'll just go quickly through the narrative. Uh, that I did share with you and also we'll take questions if you have those too. So we had 23 warrants that were signed over the summer months. Uh, the total on those warrants was $133,745.95. Uh, some of those were from fiscal year 21 as we close out the books there and then some also from 22. Is that Paula on that meeting? No. Is that yet? No. Don is asking about Bob. Well, my phone doesn't ring here. Bob is, Bob is coming. He's driving to the school to jump on the meet there because he locked himself out of his account. He's coming here? No, Chrissy invited him. Perfect. He's going on lately. Okay. You asked me to call him, and my phone doesn't. <laughs> Hi, Donna. Oh, Donna, Donna, we're on a live school. <laughs> <laughs> So we finished closing out FY20 up one with the town, um, working on reconciling our revolving funds. So we look at the town's books and our books just to make sure that everything is recorded properly because really on our end, on the school side, it's really just for bookkeeping purposes. The town handles all of the formal accounts and things like that. So um, we make sure everything is in balance. So we're currently working on that for the revolving funds. Um, but the general fund is closed out and we had a transfer of almost 65,000. That was what was remaining in the budget at the end of the year. Um, that was primarily related to accounts that would normally be fully spent in a school year, such as transportation or professional development. Um, with COVID and the learning model, you know, we did have a change in the bus contract and those things. So um, it allowed us to put some money into savings, so we reclassified that into school choice for future use. Any questions on that before I go into 22? Okay. Um, so if you have questions about those expense reports for 22, although right now they're looking to be in pretty good shape, I didn't see anything that really stood out as needing to be discussed. Um, but what I did want to bring up is that we are talking about um, an out-of-district placement that would be an additional expense for Waitley Elementary of about $35,000. Um, that was not budgeted. It wasn't something that we knew about during the budget season last year. Um, but I would recommend, given the savings from last year, that we do cover that expense from school choice and that we talk during the budget process for 23 about how to cover that expense moving forward, because I do think it'll be a multi-year if I remember the child's age and grade properly. Um, so that's the only real thing that's popped up as an unknown at this point. Um, Chrissy and I. Have... Oh, yes. Can I ask a question about that? I just don't know how it I don't remember how it works. Do we get any reimbursement? from the state for that for that expense? Likely with that dollar amount, we won't. Um, there are instances where we could get some circuit breaker reimbursement, but this is not over the circuit breaker amount. And then it's also not a school choice student where school choice would fully reimburse us for special education increments. Um, so this would be a strict expense for us. Okay. Um, like I said, I think we are looking at multiple years of that. So we'll have to talk about this again because either we continue to pay it from school choice, um, which may not be the best situation given what the projections are for the school choice fund, but we may have to add it to budget instead. Um, so, and then Christy and I have been in conversation about some other things, you know, certain things that the school needed a new laminator because we're laminating so many things now to make sure that, you know, we can wipe things down in between use. And um, there were some things needed for music that we've talked about, but otherwise, you know, things have been pretty much on par. So I feel like we're in good shape so far. It's early on in the year, but <laughs> we're in the right direction right now. 
Um, and then just a couple of other points for you all to know in regard to the business office function. So we are working on getting payroll set up in our database. Currently, we do payroll in Excel, and then we send the information over to the town because the town pays our employees at the school. Um, but I would like to have it directly done in the database. That way, our reporting is more live. Uh, for example, if you were to look on, on this report that I sent you, um, on page two, for any of the teacher salaries under the function code 2305, there's no expenses there yet because they don't get booked as payroll occurs, yet we've had two payrolls so far this school year. So it takes some time because we go back and record large journal entries versus having live data. So I really want to shift that so that we're getting more accurate reporting. And then we can also access information such as hire date, what column and step someone is on and things along those lines. So that's my goal for this year is to get us set up. Um, we started Conway last year and didn't get it finished in time because it is a pretty lengthy process. But my goal is we'll get everybody up at least testing this year and then fully on board next year. Uh, and then school lunch fund. So the school lunch fund previously was not recorded in the school's database. Um, tracking was done via Excel in the food service office. So, um, you know, there was always some question between the town and food service about what was going where. And, you know, I feel like things were just a little bit too loose than I would like them to be or looser than I would like them to be. So I'm working on tightening that up and getting that info in the database again as well. Same thing, you know, more up to date, real time data will be helpful for us, especially in account that, you know, we're talking about had two years of um, a little bit of financial hardship because of COVID. So that's the so we, what yeah. about the early childhood fund? Would that be Early childhood is already online. We'd handle that fully. Oh, okay. So I have real, real time okay. data. So I could look up today and see our revenue in and our expenses out. Whereas school lunch is a little bit behind. I have to wait for Jeff to do his Excel reports and then send them to me. And you know, it just takes time. So early okay, childhood great. I'm running already. Um, so I'm not going to go over the details in the uh, revolving fund balances. I did send you all of that info. Uh, school lunch right now, the projections look pretty good for us to be in um, a positive position for next year, which is what our goal was this year of trying to save what we can and use other funding sources if possible, given the um, lack of revenue last year. And then lunch is free and breakfast is free for all students this year as well. So we're expecting our revenues to significantly increase with students being back in the building full time. And then the reimbursement rate for lunch is much higher than a cash rate would have been. So Jeff's still working on, you know, we really only are reporting through the end of August. So we only had two days, no, three days of, or four days of school in August. Um, so I don't have good numbers as far as how many lunches were sold, how many breakfasts were sold yet. So I'm hoping that the next time that we're reporting, we'll have the full month of September to look at at least. But the projections right now look good so that we can get back on track with that fund. Um, same for early childhood. So early childhood did take a pretty big hit from FY20 into FY21. Uh, we ended the year, we started the year with 74,000 and we ended the year with 18,000. So that was a significant hit for us because we did not have a good amount of revenue coming in, um, but we did have a, a significant amount of expenses going out. However, the program is fully back up and running this year. Uh, our revenue is back up to a lot more of a quote unquote normal, a pre-COVID, I should say, numbers. Um, and our expenses are less because we decided to use ESSER grant funding to help pay for some of our early childhood salaries and wages so that we could build up the reserves in this account again. So we're looking at about $80,000 for a projection at the end of next year, um, which I think is a good spot for us to be in. And again, during budget season, we'll have to talk about what we do with those salaries and wages when that grant is no longer available. And I see we have 17 kids in preschool, looks like. Is that right, Chrissy? Yeah, there's 17, and most of them are five days a week. Um, so finally, the school choice fund. Uh, this is something that we are going to have to talk about when we start the budget process because we are overexpending in this account. Um, if you remember during budget season last year, we put an extra $15,000 on that fund so that we could keep the general fund budget increase down as low as possible. So 
Um, that was really a one-time expense, so it's actually a good use of school choice funds because it was a retirement payout, and I don't know if we'll have any retirements next year, but that's the perfect example of how to use school choice funds. Uh, but if we're putting that 35000 for the out-of-district placement on there, we are going to have to talk about what the balance will look like at the end of next year and what those projections are at. I think the good news is Darius said that he believes our school choice numbers are up. Uh, for enrollment this year. So that will increase our revenue potentially. Um, right now, I'm still erring on the conservative side based on last year's numbers, uh, but we'll make adjustments as the year goes on and the state updates things. Um, but overall, you know, I think Waitley is financially stable and in a good spot compared to where any of us thought we would be after the crisis. So I'm happy to take other questions if anyone has them. Um, I just, on the uh, school choice monthly expenditure report, there was um, the finance and administrative services looked like it was in the negative. Yeah, um, so we did not um, budget last year for the end of year report audit with um, Scanlon and Associates. So the bill came the end of June when we had already started closing out the general fund books. So we had to pay that bill from school choice. Um, that only happens every two or actually it might be three years where the town has to audit the end of year report. Um, so that was the charge from the auditor for that. There's some negative other things on that expense report because the last billing cycle for central office shared expenses. So if you look at those negative numbers like superintendents, miscellaneous expense, central office copiers, supplies, when the town closes the books, Frontier may not be 100% ready to close out yet. So there's typically a little bit of a lag time. So all four towns this year had a bill go against their school choice because you can't pay last year's bills with FY22 funds. So we had to reimburse Frontier for those central office expenses out of the school choice account. Um, so I'm talking with our audit team and with my um, business office team about how we can be more efficient with that June billing. It's hard if the town closes like say July 7th, like it's just nearly impossible to capture every single bill, especially the way that Frontier functions. So fortunately it was a small amount for Waitley and didn't have too big of a hit, but that's what those other negatives are about as well. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. Welcome, Bob. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions for Shelly? No. Nope. All right, so now we're um, up to public comment. I don't know if we have any, I don't think we do. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. All right. Now we're on to unfinished business, the COVID-19 update. So I did at the beginning of this meeting send to you my superintendent's report, which I will pull information from for the various things I'm talking about tonight. Um, so with COVID, um, a couple of things I just want to update people. We are up and running with our pool testing. Um, there are numbers in the report that I gave you um, where we stands with pool testing. Um, I did want to say that the, the the state started a new service provider or gave us a new service provider, required everybody to you know log in with new accounts, as some of you probably had to endure, um, which is a lot easier to log in and such. However, they promised us staffing and everything up and ready for the first week of September, and that's not what happened. And so we're one of the few districts that did get up and running in the area. Um, I was at a meeting last Friday, and people are very frustrated with the state's rollout of the testing program. But because we were testing last year, we had supplies on hand. And I'll be honest, because we had Meg Birch, um, who you know is, was on it right from the beginning, um, we were able to roll out. Last Starting last week, um, we did get a, a positive pool for Wheatley, as you probably have been told. Um, and you know we, we dealt with that. This week, um, we did another round of pool testing today, or yesterday, rather, in they all have come back negative. Um, am I right on that, Chrissy? I didn't, there was no, I know they were waiting on like a couple pools at the end of the day. No, we're negative. When this meeting is over, I get to send that email okay. out. To well, if anybody's watching, they get the inside scoop. This is breaking news here at <laughs> W-E-S. -W um, 
So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what's happening there. I did attend um, a meeting um, on Friday, actually attended it in Holyoke with the commissioner, uh, Jeff Riley. And I did ask him quite pointedly, you know, what is going to happen? Um, he talked about he talked about what was going to happen October 1st as he's going to revisit the mask mandate statewide. Um, and he talked about, you know, looking at the data at the end of this month, he's going to look at whether or not you're going to be, I think you may have seen some of the literature that was put out that there might be some, you know, some quotas in order to allow schools to become unmasked if they have a certain vaccination percentage, if there's a certain pool testing percentage and um, their overall community percentage of infection rate. Um, so he said, you know, basically we're looking at three different, um, you know, the three different ways it could go is one, we stay where we're at starting the month of October with the masking from, this is statewide. And again, I then asked the question, so are we then going to battle locally what we just did at the end of August? Because once the state removes its, we made the call, the state then stepped in and made the call. We had already made the call. So it was one of those things like we can, we then said, well, the state also agrees with us. Um, the state might change its recommendation. And he said, so I asked him really point blank, um, what will happen there? Are we, are we expect the ballot to get this? Because the way he explained it was that when we put in policies, it's easy. When we take away policies, it's hard. So eventually, yes, it is going to fall back on the local committees to decide how they're going to ease off of um, whatever policies, COVID policies they put into place. So whether or not it's October, maybe November, maybe later on. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of saying that out loud that that's kind of how we kind of set things up. So the state is not going to shepherd the way through this. It's very frustrating to everybody in the room, but to some level, am I, I'm upset by it, but at the same time, I understand that you have local control. The Massachusetts is set up that way, and so you can't, they can supersede in, but then they have to give it back. And so right now, our boards of health are the one who have the have voted the, the mask mandate. So to undo the mask mandate is going to take several layers. The board will have to do it, and then we would have to have a meeting and do it as well if we're going to change anything. So that's kind of the information where that stands as it's it's. I guess you could say a little complicated, um, but we'll wait and see what the state gives for guidance, and then we'll start to digest how we'll do that in October. But we are not October 1 suddenly switching over. It'll be a discussion, and it falls back to the local control. Um, while the joint meeting is messy, it is also, it's, I think it's important we work together, but I am going to say it out loud. It is your choice, you know, the, uh, on local control. You can have it in independent meetings, but I think it's best that we work as one community because if we have elementary school doing one thing, the secondary doing another, or, you know, you know, you have a union that's shared by multiple schools as well. I think it's most appropriate we act as one, um, but legally you can act separately. Um, Darius, um, yeah. just a comment about that. Um, I agree that we should, you know, include everyone um, in this discussion. However, is it possible to separate the elementary from the high school considering there is vaccination potential at the high school level and there isn't at elementary? Is that going to be a discussion at some point? I think that's an excellent point. I think you're exactly correct. We actually had talked about doing that for the um, September meeting, but because well, it was really the August meeting, but for the start of school, um, but because the board of health was running that meeting, we were invited to that meeting. So I couldn't say, Hey, you, you have two, I could have, I guess, say, well, you have two separate meetings. Um, but even at that time, I thought the prudent thing would do is to start the school mask. Um, and for those who you know are, are still upset by that decision, you know, the, we did a lot of changes at school with not just the mask, but we did a lot of changes of returning to pre-COVID conditions. So having a mask on as a kind of a buffer as we do that was important. You have a lot, you know, you don't have kids you know, for a weekly example, elementary outside all day long, they're now more inside. They're still doing a lot outside. Chrissy can talk a little about that. We're doing small group work again. We're doing a lot of things that we weren't doing before. And having that layer, literally layer of protection um, to help us transition into back to pre-COVID kind of model of teaching, I think was important. So, and especially so, it, and the same thing was happening at Frontier, even though they are, many of the students are vaccinated. Um, the same kind of idea. So yes, but I think you're right. I think splitting the two would make sense. And it also can be focused on the type of students we're talking about, because there's a big difference between vaccinated students or vaccinated opportunity students versus un students who do not have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Great. Yep. Um, let me just kind of run through if there was anything else that 
do, do. And then your pool testing numbers are there. Um, you know, 63% of eligible participants are participating in school in pool testing. Um, and we're hoping to improve that each day. Um, yeah. Any other questions on COVID? I'm sure if something comes up as we go on, you can always jump back in. Should I move on to the anti-racism? Yeah, let's do that. So I don't have a member from the committee here tonight. Um, I think they're still getting things up and running. Um, we are, I do an announcement to make though. Um, we did hire the um, Radical Empathy Consulting Group, which is the group that did professional development with um, Frontier last year. Um, we really were looking, we were looking at, we looked at other options as well, trying to get an outside consultant to help guide us because we have these different committees, a lot of great work that's happening, but there was always this kind of, uh, at least I was hearing, who's double checking this? You know, who, who's somebody who knows how we are doing this work that is kind of, you know, proofing outside lens on, on what we're doing and doing throughout the year. So we hired them. They are going to help lead the, um, the equity committee and also work with the administration in planning, you know, what, what, you know, looking at what we're doing for PD. We already have things established, but kind of proofing it and helping to steer us with that outside model. Um, they are a group that you know came out of UMass. Um, if you want to know more about them, but um, I asked for them to send us a bio. We'll, we'll put that up on our website as soon as we have it. Um, but you know, they're a group that came out of UMass. They provided great training last year for the secondary. They liked them, received quite well. Um, and again, they're going to they're going to continue to provide us professional development at the secondary level, but now also um, take on this this additional thing to help the administration and the committee um, navigate how what we're doing moving ahead. So we're hoping to have our first joint meeting with all our committee members. We're we're trying to do it on the 29th. We're waiting for confirmation. As soon as I get that, I'm going to send. A, I already have it drafted up a community letter to everyone. Um, if people want to attend and recruit new members who are interested in in that work um, and what we're doing and that kind of thing. So that's kind of the update there. So Darius, last year, the elementary school focus was on professional development. So is this year when they're gonna have the slight adjustments to the curriculum? Well, yeah, this year we're, we're gonna start writing curriculum and put it, figuring out how to integrate. And, and this got um, just being very sensitive to the fact that it's been misinterpreted by people that we are launching a, um, you know, a, a culture of, re, you know, a, a curriculum that, um, you know, is basically talking just about racism and white privilege. And some people went, you know, some, uh, you know, members of the community went in and looked at what the faculty were learning. They were thinking that that was then going to be taught in the classroom. And that, that's not the case. Um, we're looking about, you know, how do we take, um, making a culturally responsible classroom, and I can share with you what you know, Desi looks at for what happens in a culturally responsive classroom, making sure that all groups are recognized and um, lessons are including everyone and no one's being um, you know, left out and those kind of things, and building that within your within our curriculum. And I, I know I um, talked a little bit that at a school committee m many months ago about when you do lesson plans, are you sensitive to all the learners in your classroom? from special education to diverse backgrounds, diverse languages, and you know, that kind of thing, um, and diverse learning styles, it's putting all those kind of things. That's the main focus um, of building lessons with those kind of things, so. Okay, great, thank you. Now, does anyone else have any questions? All right, so we're on to new business, the summer building maintenance update. So on some of these, I've asked Chrissy to kind of, she's kind of been on the front line of it. So I think her principal report is kind of a mixture of these things as we go along as well, right? I got to say the road looks great, the driveway. Yes. Um, so yes, this is part of my, my principal's report, but that just means it'll be quicker for me to read what's left when we're done. Um, first, I wanted to thank the people who work on the building all summer. Um, not a big crew this year, but... Van Talbot, who does anything and everything around here, Mary Lisensky as well, and Kathy Simmons, who, you know, painted, cleaned, did whatever needed to be done in order to have us ready um, for the new school year. And I also want to thank the town for its generosity in 
helping us to keep the, the building in top shape and the campus looking fantastic. Um, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find another school in the area that that looks as great as our school does and it really functions very solidly. Um, so in addition to the regular deep clean that, that happens every summer, um, the following projects were completed. And the biggest one, of course, is the driveway and parking lot repavement. It made such a difference. It kind of makes it look like a new school. Um, the light posts out front, which had been rusting, and I think Bob Holland and I had talked about this a few years ago, um, those got scraped down and painted. Um, we have new floors in two classrooms. Um, the only reason we didn't do additional classrooms is because um, just like everything else, the, the product is on back order. So we're going to have to wait until the Christmas break to do the additional rooms. Um, there is a new mini split in the staff room. The gym floor didn't get the full makeover like it did a few years ago, the, the very big one, but they did come in and they um, just sand it down a little bit and um, put another layer of poly and it looks brand new again. Um, we bought new picnic tables for pre-K and kindergarten. That might not sound like a big deal, but our pre-Ks and kindergarten, they're still outside much of the time. Um, and, and I was watching pre-K kids trying to eat breakfast off a tray that was on the ground and it was a little painful. They don't mind the dirt and the ants crawling all over it, but it, uh, it was something that we wanted to address, to address. So we bought these really solid picnic tables that are going to last much longer than I am going to last. Um, and they're so heavy that we don't have to worry about tipping over and, and that kind of thing. And it'll also give them a space where they can do some work outside. So that was kind of big. Um, we had to, uh, two very happy teachers when they saw their picnic tables. Um, the, the office got all new furniture, including um, my office, Mary and the assistant clerk. Um, we had problems with the electricity out front with the lights that hang in front of the school. Um, it hasn't really been a problem in the last year and a half because we don't have an evening events here, but I'm hoping that we will again. So those got repaired. Um, we repainted the reading specialist room. We got new wood chips on the playground and over near the pre-K K sidewalk, the the dirt had kind of worn away and there was a, it was kind of a big step and it was, it was a, a tricky spot where someone could get hurt. So um, that got regraded. I think that's what you'd call it. Um, and those were kind of our big, our big projects. Um, I have a question because I saw in the, the Waitley Scoop, the town newsletter, that um, the town received a grant, a second grant for the complete streets grant. And um, it said something for some other work, but also to construct a multi-use path at the Waitley Elementary School. So where's that? Is that going to be the sidewalk down that's from that, Long? Yeah, that's that sidewalk. And it was, the timing was a little unfortunate. It would have been great to be able to have those two projects coordinate with one another. Um, and we, I have to talk to whoever the project manager is going to be because we still, um, we still need that sort of dirt path that's on the side of the road in order to be able to have cars in line and also buses to pass by. So they're going to have to think a little bit about the placement of that sidewalk. But um, and I also have to think about who's going to clear it when it snows. But I, I think it'll be great to have a, a sidewalk that goes down to the street. Chris, it's going to be cute. I had a conversation with him about like how the timing of the two didn't line up. And he said, it, it's not that big of a deal that they didn't line up. I mean, obviously we want them both at the same time, but so we'll talk with Keith about that. And Keith's great and very responsive to us. Yes. Yeah. I'd hate for it to see, see that project put cracks in our new driveway. <laughs> okay. How about so that is that it for the updates? Does anyone have any questions? And how about the summer programs update? So we unfortunately didn't have summer programs here at Waitley. Um, our students combined with the students at Deerfield um, for a variety of reasons. The the biggest one was that um, finding nursing staff to work over the summer was very challenging. So it made sense to combine 
um, with with Deerfield, and I think that worked out really well. <clears throat> Kids had a great experience over there. Okay, and how about personnel update? So, first of all, I appreciate that we had such little turnover. Turnover seems to be the name of the game all over the place. Um, and we have three new employees, three new instructional assistants. Um, Nancy Leva, who previously worked in pre-K and then returned last year as a long-term sub, um, has joined us as an instructional assistant in third grade. Raquel Klosta is our new instructional assistant in fifth grade, and Aaron Regan Ladd has joined the pre-K team as our newest instructional assistant there. And um, what are those, Sarah Chapdelaine and Mary Burke Reef? Is that um, is that new, or is that? Oh, okay. No, Sarah's been around as long as I have. She. Well, yeah, I know who she is, but yeah. it's on this. Um, this list, their two names. Out of school time hires. Oh, oh okay. that's right, that's right. Sorry, I should have picked that up. So maybe they may have been out of school time before, but they didn't work last year because we didn't have out of school time, or right. something right. like that. So maybe that's why they're back on the list as a new hire. Okay. And I do have to say that Wheatley, um, while it's on the agenda, you're like, wow, why is this on the agenda? They are the only school that did not have the um, a large turnover. We had more staff turnover than the highest I've ever seen since my being in the district. And I imagine let's go, it's 15 years. So I've had 20 years. We were double the number of teaching uh, faculty members um, turnover and Wheatley had well, zero, right? Other than some shifting of stuff. So um, it, shows I think that, that, it shows that people want to be there. Chris. That's what I was going to say. It reflects on the quality of their job. Okay. So now we are on to the MOU. Yes, that's me. Um, so under the Every Student Succeeds Act, we are required as a school to provide transportation to any student that is considered homeless or in foster care. Um, there is an MOU with DESE, um, the DCF, Department of Children and Families, and the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and school districts slash towns. Um, the MOU allows us to put in for reimbursement of transportation expenses. This particular one is for foster care. I'm still waiting for information on anyone who might be considered a homeless student, but this particular one is for foster care. Um, so if you went through, you know, I, I think it was attached in the packet that Donna gave you. There were quite a few definitions under there. There's the title. Um, grant that this falls under where the federal reimbursement comes from um, and what the role is of the school district in submitting a request for reimbursement. There's forms that we have to fill out. Um, so what Darius and I are asking is that the school committee support the town in signing this MOU with DCF and DESE. Um, we, Darius could be the appointed signer by the town, but technically the select board, because the school falls under the town, has to accept this officially. Uh, we did talk with the town administrators about it, and they had, you know, said, sure, we can add it to an agenda. It'd be great to have school committee support as well. And um, I don't actually think that this would be something that is um, frequently used and accessed in Waitley because of the population. However, there's no reason to not have it in place should it come up for us. Um, in some of our other schools in the district, it, it is a, a bit more of a issue that we deal with year to year. It varies all the time. Um, but I would like your support in putting through. Um, you don't get full reimbursement. It's usually about 75%. Um, so if you're just transporting one child for a short amount of time, you know, it's not a whole lot, but we don't budget for a line item like this. Uh, if it does come up, we find funds, whether it's, you know, we run over the transportation line or we take from school choice, um, but would we'll just allow the school to be able to recoup some of that unbudgeted expenditure. And um, do we need, we don't need to vote on that right now. Okay. Well, I think we're you're voting to recommend that we bring. So the town administrator said that the select boards really like it when they 
if you're backing it, they're voting on something you're backing. So maybe you, you moved for us to bring it to the school, you bring it to the select board for them to decide, I guess, and vote that. I don't know, it just shows us a symbol, symbolically that you agree that this is what we should do. It's, so, it's, it's, it's really a no brainer. But they just they just asked like the school committee should decide on that first and send it to us to sign is basically which is proper which is good that they're asking for us that because it is the proper chain of command kind of deal. Okay, so what we would be voting on is to support this and to agree to it and move it to select board. Okay, right. do I hear a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Thank you. Hey, Darius, can I just ask a question? Uh, do you have a number of how many kids do we have in our district that fall in this category? So it's a moving target. You know, you can have, home, you know, homelessness can happen and then be resolved all within one school year. A foster placement could be a temporary foster placement. You know, remember you guys signed a new policy a little while back, was part of all these other kind of policies. It was a group that went through probably about a year ago, maybe two years ago, that talked about that we will um, support, you know, students, foster students and, and homeless students and that kind of thing. So um, basically what used to happen is if you were, let's say you were attending, I'll use Frontier Regional, just so it's not impersonal here, you were attending Frontier Regional and your foster placement moved you to Northampton. Well, they used to then pull you from Frontier and then stick you into Northampton. So not only are your home removed, but all your friends are going to be removed as well. So the foster, um, you know, DCF has worked very hard to change that model to try to keep students in the same school district for as long as, for as long as students want to stay there, I believe. Um, and so, you know, so that they they have that kind of, they have their, their family at school and in that community and that kind of thing. So immediately if some of the foster placement got changed, we would be paying for transportation for that child from Northampton to, we usually split it with the sending district, um, but we would pay Northampton and us would split the 50-50 to send their child. Likewise, if a child is at Northampton is fostered in our district, they many times will continue to go to the district they're in. But they, they, you know, they have meetings where they make this decision and look it out in the best interest of the child. So I don't have anywhere near a number. And if I gave you a number, it could change next week. You know that kind of stuff. Um, there is, I will say, in some communities, this is a big number, and they budget it because the amount of uh, either foster placements or the transient population of that or homelessness is much higher. So they have to be prepared to, to spend that money. So okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, now we're on to the revised public comment policy, BEDH. So, um, you know, this is going to be an interesting one because normally a policy like this we do jointly, but um, I just, you know, I'm kind of saying it out loud. It's, it's very difficult <laughs> to get five separate bodies to agree on something at five separate meetings, and we can't all do everything together. You know, here's the, one of those things, but this one I'm kind of rolling out there separately, and we'll see where it goes. But um, as you know, it, uh, the last meeting really showed a, a weakness in our policy in the sense that we were reading for, you know, we were reading public comments that we had, you know, we had reached out to do that. But when you do a double, when you do a debate, not a debate, but a, a discussion, open forum on, on things and people are submitting public comment, our attorney very much, even prior to the, that meeting, but we had already set it in motion, um, frowned upon us reading public comments a lot. Um, for, for a number of reasons. One, um, in the world of video, if I was to read something out loud, someone said, look what Mr. Modesto said, um, it could be taken out of context, it's not my words. Two, if um, someone's in violation of our policy and says something either, um, uh, you know, says something rude or attacks a, a member of our community or something of that sort, we would then be editing someone's words, which can get you even in more trouble because then you're, you're, you know, you're, you're censoring, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and third is, you know, basically all the school committee members had read it, you know, had read all those things. And there was, a, I received some, you know, comments from school members. Why are we reading these out loud? We already read through these in, in some cases more than once. Um, you know, we've received that feedback. We can acknowledge that feedback. And so um, what we're looking to do is, is change the, 
public comment policy to change to written comments submitted to the school committee will not be read aloud by the school committee or school or school personnel during the meeting. Um, the chair, you know, we don't have to talk about the, in here, but the chair does have discretion to alter these rules. So if we had a member, um, I mean, sometimes it's a, a night like tonight and you get something that says, I want to thank people. I want a, a letter that says, I want to thank, you know, something like that. Five seconds to read, 10 seconds to read, um, which is far different than a night where, you know, we have 30 people who are there in person. And there was also comments from people in person who felt like, you know, I'm here this evening and I'm being, you know, someone's written, you know, I'm talking to someone who's even here to speak or put their words, you know, verbally out there. So, um, or if there's somebody who's unable to speak, you know, I think the chair can make you know, an exception to that as well. Um, but that's the that's the idea behind that. Um, I do think our policy overall still fits under MASC. I think I sent an email out to all of you that we attempted to rewrite it prior to COVID, and then it got tabled again, and then we rewrote it so to fit to this world of technology. Um, outside of that, I had the you know the uh, attorney look at it, and he says that that's good to go. Um, from his perspective. So um, maybe we don't have to sit down and rewrite it at this time, but I'm recommending that change and you guys can take it from here. It's your policy. And it really is your policy because you represent the people who are trying to public comment. So um, and your thoughts on that? Are we going to vote on it tonight or is it one of those ones that we read it this month and do it next month or do you want us to? I would, I would recommend that depending on how you feel. Okay, you could say you want to sit on it. Um, that's why we have usually do a double reading. But something that is requires, um, you know, an action sooner than later. You know, we could without this policy. If we have a joint meeting next month to talk about masks, we would, we would face a letter writing campaign again, um, for to for people to get their points. You know, it takes up. You know, public comment is important, but you also I, try, I say this out loud that, that we also have the business of the public meeting, you know what I mean? And so the, you really have to say like, you know, you know, there's a limited amount of time and that's hard to do when you know, cut down people's writing where, you know, people were, I know we got comments that people were upset that some of the written statements were longer than two minutes. Yet if you were there in person, you only can speak two minutes. Another complication I forgot to bring up earlier. So I would recommend that you waive the two readings and you voted tonight if you, if you're leaning that way already. But if you need time to digest it and you want to get feedback from people, um, it's really your call. You can say that's where your authority is, it's policy. But that's that's the what I will recommend to every committee. I have two more tonight. I'll recommend that they waive and, and vote that moving forward if they agree with that. I'll make a motion that we accept the revised policy BEDH. I'll second that. Okay. I, I have <clears throat> I, I'm prepared to vote on it too. I just want to ask a couple questions before we vote. It's not it's not going to change my vote, so I don't know. Um, but in the second paragraph, there's some things you know li lined out about what you just said, and then it says mailing address and email address will be provided on the posting notice for each meeting. What addresses are those? Are the so people can still submit public comment to you. You're just not going to read it. Okay. So people, you know, so people, you still are encouraging people to write to you regarding subjects that are being discussed. It's just that we're not going to read those out loud. We're going to, and in fact, okay. we could, you, I would say a good practice by the chair would say to acknowledge that I received four letters regarding this subject. And I would like to thank people to let people know that you've gotten letters and read them. Um, but you're not going to say, okay, letter number one, right. so-and-so is saying this. So, um, yeah, so I think it's a... Uh, okay, and the other thing I want to ask about is number three says topics for discussion must be limited to those items listed on the school committee meeting agenda for that evening. It's, oh, okay. that, is, that is true, and that's it's always been there. It's not a new thing. Um, basically, if we're talking about what we're talking about tonight and someone comes in and we've been very lenient on that, especially when there's not much to be talked about. But if someone come in and wanted to talk about, um, you know, outdoor education, which wasn't on our agenda, most things are, as you can say, budget and, 
you know, you know, COVID and those kind of things are on every agenda. So people, most things are agenda. But if you wanted to go way off topic, um, one you could call a point of order and say, like, listen, that's not on tonight's agenda. Uh, we can put it on the next agenda. That kind of thing. I think it, it's there for a reason for people who are trying to. Um, what's happening across the state is that groups are trying to. Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, Overtake school committee meetings. Yeah, but I'm trying to do it nicer. When you do it, when you filibuster uh, meetings, so let's make these very long. Let's you know, let's all kind of come on and talk about certain things. And this allows you to say, listen, we're this is a you know, this is a business meeting of the school committee, and we have an agenda. And if people would like stuff to be put on the agenda, they should write you a letter that says you'd like this to be put on the agenda. You know what I mean? And then you'd put it on the agenda for discussion. If you show up without stuff that's not on the agenda, you're 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 breaking down the purpose of the meeting, what we're talking about. And so again, the chair can give leeway on that. If someone came today and said, I really want to talk about the swing set outside, um, it's not on the agenda, but I would like the school committee to know I'd like to get a new swing set and you should be looking at that. Um, you know, if it's not disruptive, you wouldn't call it point of order. And I also bring up, because I know we're going to discuss this at other school committee meetings um, when talking about this, is that there were points in the other meeting where um, comments were made, you know, some there was some swearing involved in our last meeting, and there were some comments made where people felt were insensitive, that wasn't sensitive to um, people of color in our community. Um, and I know people made statements out there, but afterwards there, were, there was also comments like school committee should have done more. We received some letters regarding that. I do want to say that whenever, you know, we're going to talk about this more at the, the, the larger meetings, but a, the, the, the thing to do on something like that is that and we're going to talk about, I think, at Frontier as well, because I have a committee member that wants to really discuss this, is that you call for a point of order and you coach the chair. You know, I don't say, Chrissy, you shouldn't be saying that. I say, um, you know, Madam Chair, I believe Chrissy's comments are inappropriate toward our policy. And can we you know, let, you know, let, the, let the crowd know that you cannot, you know, let the you know, guests know that they can't, you know, swear at the superintendent. You know what I mean? So, you know, that, you know, something of that, you know, that nature, but I want people to know, but whenever there's a question of like, um, I think that person's, you know, said me over, right, you can call for a point of order. And that also allows, I also have to say in defense of our chairs and our school committee members, these are stressful meetings and there's 250 people on and there's, there's a decision that you're going to have to make that affects people's lives. You, you may not be hearing certain things or you're, you're worried about all the things we worry about and that we need each other to point out you know, that, you know, you know, Madam Chair, point of order, you said two minutes, this person's gone on for five. And I, I want to, you know, that kind of, we got to support different people um, in those meetings to let people know, because sometimes you don't recognize it or you're like, you know what, that person speaking is my neighbor and this is getting really complicated, you know, and that we help each other out in those words. There's my speech. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we had a motion and a second. Sorry, one okay. clarification. Um, those people that do still submit written comments, do they still have the opportunity to speak and read those in front of the committee? Okay. They could submit and then say, I'll be, I'll be attending and reading these, or they can read them and then say, I'd like to submit them for the public record. Okay. So both things can say, both things can happen. And if someone wants to submit something that's long, wants to read something, but it's long, let's say, again, we're in the, our, our, our policy says three minutes unless the chair determines there's too many people. And that's what happened at the last meeting. Um, but you could say, listen, I got a 10 page packet. I want you all to read. I'm going to just give you a, a three minute summary, but I'm not going to submit it for the whole thing for public record for and when it's put in as public record. The public then can read that full comment for those who are listening. Like, why would someone want to submit that stuff? But someone could say, Oh, I'm interested in what this research, this person's talking about on swing sets and so on and so forth. You know, got to keep my theme there. Um, I do have, Point of order, you have to waive your policy for a two reading before you vote a single policy. So the first motion should be I vote, I move to waive our our our, our two reading of policies. First and second, vote that, then vote the policy after that. Very good. Use a point of order. So moved on the on the first one to whatever Darius said. <laughs> Made your Wait. your two readings. Yeah. Wave the two readings. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. 
passes unanimously. And now, um, do we have to redo the motion to approve the new pol the amended just, policy? Just say that you move to. I move to re revise the policy B E D H. Yes. Second. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay. <clears throat> now we're into the joint conference of the MASC, MASS. Um, it's in November. And um, I didn't know if was any of you signed up to go this year. You're you are Bob. I'm I'm going, but I'm not sure if I'm going for Waitley or if I'm going for Frontier or both. I'm I, I'm not totally sure who else have Frontier. I would imagine there's I think Olivia from our group last year or two years ago went, and Bob Decker did also, but Bob's not there anymore. So I'm going to say I'm probably going to be going for Waitley. Okay. And let's give you other ones. Are you guys going? Think about going or? No, I'm I'm not going this year. Okay. Um, and I don't think Beth was going either. Right? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll be happy to be our delegate at. Okay. Thank I know you. there'll be. I know there's probably at least one more person from Frontier going for a delegate. So. Yeah. So we usually um, have to nominate a delegate. There's a special meeting, and um, they will vote on many many things. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, Bob. Yep. Do we have to we have to vote on that? Um, Technically, yes, we do. So, do I hear a motion to nominate Bob as the official delegate for the MASC joint meeting in November? So moved. I second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Okay. Excellent. All right, now we're on to reports. Um, I don't really have much, but I I just wanted to say that we um, the chairs got an email from CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, and they had let us know this year. Well, they're having their first meeting, first of all, on September 28th at 6 o'clock. It's Tuesday night, and it's a networking night to learn about CPAC and connect with local families. Um, there'll be a discussion group following the meeting and anyone's welcome, family members, caregivers, staff, school committee. So I just want to first say that their first meeting is September 28th. Also, they're gonna be updating their public meeting format. And this year, they're gonna have three business meetings on October 12th, January 18th, and April 12th, and they're going to be at 6 p.m., and they were estimating they'd only be about half an hour, and they were asking each of the school committees to designate a CPAC liaison that would attend the meetings, and um, the intent is to keep the school committee informed on special education in our district, and it will give us um, these meetings give an opportunity to hear about the work that they're doing and to hear updates directly from the special ed director and other administrators if they're present. Um, they said that the school committee liaison wouldn't, they're not asking them to be there to speak, but they can speak if they want to. It, it would be in a listening capacity. So I didn't know if anybody was interested in doing that for those three meetings. Um, I just have to, I could do it um, as long as my schedule allows. So if we could get back to that another time, I, I'd be happy sure. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I um, The first one, what did I say? It was October 12th. I don't know what date our next school committee meeting is, um, but yeah, I, and if you can't, I can, or maybe Bob can. I don't know if we need to vote on this. Um, I mean, I, we can we can group get together as a group or something and figure out if somebody can't go on a particular date. I'm happy to go to one of the meetings if if if, if one of you can't go. The first one you said is the 28th of September. The 12th, October 12th at six o'clock. I can on October 12th. You I can. I can't. I'm away for work. Yeah. 
and I don't, um, I'm just, I have all my kids' sports stuff so in another place. I'm going to have to check on that. Um, Are label. these meetings in person or, or virtual? No, they're virtual. There's a Zoom. They're, I, I'm, I think they're virtual. I'd have to double check the email, but I'm assuming they're virtual because their CPAC meeting, their regular meetings are virtual. It's on Zoom. I might be able to do it then if it's uh, not in person. Okay. All right. Well, we can just um, check our schedules and, like, you know, assign us whoever's available to those meetings. All right. Uh, let me see. Well, I also wanted to say, also in the Waitley scoop, I saw the Waitley Cultural Council, and you probably already know about this, Chrissy. They're looking for proposals to be submitted by October 15th. They have they have grants and they've given the school money for different things. Like, I don't know which, I don't remember which things they've paid for. If it was when we've had groups come like the Marionettes or um, the Berkshire that music group. Um, yeah, um, we actually have a grant money that was set aside in March of 2020. We were supposed to have the marionettes come, and we all know what happened with that. Um, so the marionettes are actually coming to us on September 30th. Oh, cool. Um, this year, and they're going to do um, two shows outside. That's great. So, weather, weather permitting. If it has to be inside, we can do it because splitting the... the the school in half gives us enough space in the gym for kids to spread out, but um, we're really hoping for the opportunity for kids to be outside so they could take their masks off during the performance. But excited really to, good. I'm excited to see some normal things come, come back into play. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will certainly, Paula King usually uh, coordinates that kind of thing for the, the Cultural Council grant. So um, we will certainly see what else we'd like to, to, to bring to Waitley. Okay, great. Yep, um, and that's all I have. I have not had a collaborative meeting. Um, I haven't even looked at the schedule of that. So there's usually one at the end of September, I think. And we have that, we have a new executive director with the collaborative. So that's it for me. How about you, Chrissy? Got anything left on your report? Um, yeah. Um, we had our back to school ice, ice cream social, which again, it was something we did pre COVID and it was nice to have it again. Um, we held it on the 25th, the day before school started. Typically what we would do on that day is kids would come, families would come get ice cream and then they'd go visit classes. We had to adapt a little bit to, um, to keep safety in mind. So the teachers were outside and the families could go visit. So it, it was nice um, to have that back again. And it was another, somehow we managed to do this every year. It was like 102 degrees that day. So it was good to have ice cream, but it also, you know, for the little ones after about a minute, it was dripping all over the place. Um, on August 26th, we welcomed our students in kindergarten through grade six to begin the new school year. It was such a smooth opening. Um, I'm not sure what, what I was expecting, but I've just brought back to September of last year and how stressful and how difficult that was um, and how concerned we were about how kids were gonna handle all this. And and um, relative to that, it was just it was smooth sailing. Um, I would say late spring, we kind of thought that we'd be, you know, not having masks and some of these other things would be done, but that's, that's not our reality right now. Um, but despite the fact that we're still following some of those protocols that have been part of the COVID experience, the students have handled it really well um, and seem genuinely happy to be back. So um, all is well on, on that front. And I wanted to thank um, the Waitley Elementary School staff for pulling together to make that return so smooth. And also um, Superintendent Modesto, Kim McCarthy, Scott Paul, Bill Hildreth, and Jeff McDonald for supporting us with that whole thing. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not give a special shout out to Nurse Andrea Gray and Mary Lisensky. As Darius mentioned, um, we're working with a new company this year, 
and um, the kinks were not really ironed out when it was time for us to do this, but a decision was made that it was very important for us not to delay by a week. And we were proof positive that it was a good idea not to delay a week. So uh, Mary and Andrea worked late one day, got the system all ready to go, and it, it ran beautifully because of their extra work. So um, I really appreciate that they did that. It, it, it would have been, I think, quite unfortunate, the end result, had we not pool tested last week. So mm -hmm. big shout, shout out to them. Um, and again, Andrea has only been with us during COVID. She has no idea what a regular school year looks like. So <laughs> she's in for a treat someday. Um, we're excited to become a Girls on the Run site this fall. Yay, Girls on the Run. Um, it's a program for girls in grades three through six, and the students will meet twice a week for eight weeks with volunteer coaches from our community, one of whom is a school committee member. <laughs> Thank you, Beth Riley. Um, and they've, they've been trained through the Girls on the Run organization. Each session involves a lesson focused on building social, emotional, and physical skills. At the end of the eight weeks, the participants will run a 5K with students from other area schools that have also been working with Girls on the Run. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm so glad. I, I know our previous nurse tried to get that going and it didn't, so I'm so happy to see that. It's not easy because it requires a lot of coordination of people who can volunteer their time. And I'm planning to be there as much as possible, but I hesitated to say that I can always be there and then have something fall apart. So um, I, I will be there. I've got my running shoes ready to go for tomorrow, and I'm really excited to you know, spend some time with kids in a sort of different setting. Um, so I'm excited to have that happen. Um, we're going to have open house in person next week um, on September 23rd. And in order to invite everyone in safely, we'll be having three 15-minute shifts. So families will be assigned a shift for each child in the family um, who attends West. And I think this was a really good compromise. I know some folks are doing an all outside and all outdoors open house, but the big deal, at least at Waitley with open house, is the kids love to have their parents come in and show them, this is where I sit, this is my mess of a desk. Um, you know, the, the big deal is coming in the building. So um, it won't be the same as, as always. There won't be people wandering through the building. Uh, families will enter through the classroom's exterior door so that we can keep congestion down um, in the hallways. And teachers who are not assigned to one particular classroom, so um, specials teachers, special ed teachers, reading specialists, they will be available um, under one of the tents out front so that families can then come and um, say hello to them and have a chat. But we thought it was a, a good compromise to be able to allow kids that um, that little bit of open house that they enjoy, which is to show off their, their classroom. I think that's great because we haven't really been inside in a long time, the parents. So I, I like that. Yeah, it, it is a little strange that we, you know, the, the front door got left open after arrival one day last week and a parent walked in and Mary said, I was like, I didn't know what to do. There was a, <laughs> someone in the building and I wasn't used to having, <laughs> there was someone who was masked and it wasn't a big deal, but it was just, it reminded us what a strange time this is. You know, at one time, we wouldn't have thought anything about, you know, having parents come in the building. We liked having that kind of open communication with people who can stop by, but um, it's been very unfriendly circumstances lately. So it won't, it won't be the social event that it usually is in terms of what's happening in the building, but my hope is that we get a really good weather night and that people can sort of meander around out front um, because the other part of open house night is for families to see each other, not just what's what's going on in the school. So I'm really excited that we're going to be able to do that. So fingers crossed that the rain and the snow hold off. Yeah, good snow because you never know. Um, right. So that's it for me. I got, a, I got one question. Yeah. What's the, um, how should I say this? Is there a lot of parents picking up the kids after school and dropping them off in the morning? where there's a traffic jam. Cause I went by Sunderland one of the first couple of days and the buses were running away and the bus couldn't even get into the opening of the school at Sunderland because the cars were backed up all the way to the street. Yeah. So Are I would we say having that kind of problem. 
I would say never judge anything in terms of pick up and drop off based on the first few days. I know I was, you know, ripping my hair out. Darius is probably sick of hearing from me about this, but things just were not working well. Um, and I think it's just, we forget from year to year that it takes a while to reestablish those routines. Um, bus routes changed a little bit. There are more kids riding the bus last year, particularly at the beginning of the year. You know, we didn't have very many kids riding the buses, so the bus routes were shorter and it was easier for the buses to be everywhere at a, at a particular right. time. But, um, we've, we've worked it out. It flows pretty well. Um, we're a small school. I think we have probably between kindergarten and sixth grade, almost half of the kids get on a bus and go home. So it doesn't leave us with a tremendous amount of traffic. And we, we try and I have um, both in the morning and the afternoon, I have seven or eight staff members who stand in a station out on, on the sidewalk and they unload and load kids so that we can move it along pretty quickly. Okay. Just, just asking, I saw what Sunderland was going through and I was hoping we weren't parked all the way out to the street and stuff like that. So. Yeah. And on top of that, there was, we had problems at frontier. I say we at frontier because my, my office was here. So I saw it firsthand that we also had to cancel athletics five minutes before school went out because of the heat. And so all of a sudden you had all these kids who weren't planning on taking the bus going, what bus am I on? And so that, you know, that changes everything. And then, you know, middle schoolers don't know what bus to get on. People, have to, you know, there's all of a sudden two buses. There's 11 sitting out there. Um, which also brings me up, and I can my superintendent report is going to be quick because it's the only thing I have left to talk about is that um, Gripco Transportation is looking for drivers. If anybody knows anybody who wants to be a bus driver, um, there is a shortage statewide, as people have seen, or have other districts. I've talked to other superintendents who don't know what to do. And if you may have saw, Charlie Baker has, or Governor Baker has um, enacted the National Guard to help with this problem because they can't get enough drivers. And so we're actually, Waitley's okay, but there are other. Um, Deerfield has had a pull route because there was not enough drivers. And so, and then on top of that with athletics and, and doing all that, they're doing an amazing job of making things happen, but they're also on the money side of it. Cause that's always going to be your question is that they, they are losing money because they can't fulfill all their bus routes. Meanwhile, we have buses that have more students on them than normal um, because we had to change routes around. So, um, but yeah, if anyone wants to be a bus driver, contact Gripco Transportation or contact me and I will put you up there. <laughs> Or join the National Guard, and you'll find yourself driving a bus. <laughs> um, Chrissy, I, I had a question. I think you probably mentioned it, or, or somebody mentioned it earlier. I was wondering if we were, we still have the tents. Were we doing any classwork outside? Yeah, the, the tents are there for um, classwork outside. The kids are getting lunch outside. Um, we are using the cafeteria again, particularly for the little ones. The older kids can, they go through the cafeteria, they get their lunch on the tray. We're not packaging everything up like we were um, last year, which is saving a ton of waste. And so the older kids can go right out, go out the front door and eat under the one of the tents in the front. And there's, as you know, two tents in the back. There's picnic tables in the back. So um, we're really utilizing our outdoor space pretty well. But we're very lucky that we still have the tents. A lot of people rented tents. and it's expensive and so they did not take on that expense for, for this coming school year so I, I feel very lucky and I also I should give a shout out um, Darius and his son and Bill Hildreth met me here on the Saturday before Hurricane Henri um, they thankfully didn't show up but they were here with me to take those tents down so that we didn't lose them I, I feel an obligation to turn them over to the town at some point in you know in one piece <laughs> So we, I, I'm very grateful that we have those. Perfect. I have a quick question. Um, I don't know if this has ever been brought up before, but we did have a question about air conditioning. Oh, yes, that's so right. Only affects, you know, a couple weeks at the beginning of school and a couple weeks at the end. Um, I do know there is one classroom in Waitley that does have air conditioning. Um, has there been discussion about mini splits or adding any kind of air conditioning to the school? Thank you, Beth. I forgot. Yeah, no, excellent question on that. And actually, um, the town is actually selected, I think, Bob, right? Bob, you're on that committee? Yes. To talk about, so there's an influx of money with, into the town, and they're looking at their municipal buildings to figure out where where they can you know, use money. And I think looking at putting in AC into Waitley is something that 
if we're not going to do it that way, we start looking at capital expenses. Um, I'm looking at this actually in all the elementary schools. Um, and I am trying to coordinate with how the town of Wheatley wants to do it. I propose that we do a, a subcommittee with a select board member or a finance committee member and a school committee member and talk about how can we do this over a series of years in a way that makes sense to get the max money, maximum for the money and the max usage um, so that we can slowly roll out. Because it's not just those couple weeks, but it's also you're seeing buildings getting shut down due to mold because of the amount of moisture that's being trapped in buildings during the summer. Um, as you can see, you know, you know, poor South Hadley, I mean, they've been shut down. They're still shut down. They're shut down next week as well. Um, and that has to do with uncirculating air and not being able to handle moisture as we had. Any, I mean, it feels more humid. I know we've had humid stretches like this before, but um, it feels a little bit more humid this year than I've seen in recent years. So that as well as when we talk about AC and people say, yay, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we ran the wood stove during the summer, you know, so it, this is a little bit different. It's um, also taking care of the building. So um, anyways, Bob's on a committee to talk about that particular money. And I think we're using, if they're going to allow us to use it, some of that money for that, um, we kind of roll that into a three or five year plan. Um, and so we will have um, our carrier come out to take a look at how we would do it. Is it mini splits per each room? Is it a central unit with ducting going to multiple rooms? What's the best way to run it? Each building's different. Um, already, at, you know, looking at different buildings at this, and some of them are talking about you need a rooftop unit to do this, and some of them like one by one mini splits, individual systems. Um, so we'll find out what those are. At. Great. That was so, sort of on my wish list because we're um, coming up on being done with flooring. So I figured that air conditioners could kind of work the same way if there was not other money available for it, that we would we would do them over a, a period of time. But and what's it's not even what's it's kind of funny is it's almost the same price. So a mini split to a classroom is around seven or eight grand, and that was basically the cost of redoing the classroom floor. So you're also talking about I mean, we increase that slightly, but the town's kind of taken on this this rolling um, improvement to the building. And Waitley, the building in Waitley is in great shape. And I think that would be a, um, could also be a cooling station for Waitley residents on hot summer days as well. So we get multiple use out of that. And in some of those days when it's chilly, but not too cold, some of those mini splits can be used for heat for the room versus burning whatever we're burning, oil or gas. I don't think we have gas here, but we got oil. So, we, you know, that's, Maybe a savings there on a year when oil's really expensive, you know? You actually run on gas. Chris oh. taught me that this year. <laughs> you actually run on gas. I wouldn't believe it okay. either. You gas line for school. <laughs> I didn't know if we I didn't know if we were part of that moratorium where they weren't going to give it to us so quite a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, no, that was well, 91, right? Is when that school building. Oh, geez, I'm not not, not I'm that many years. You're getting old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, with the air conditioning, will we also have to consider the budget for um, the utility when we, you know, are doing the budget for the next year and whatever we put towards the utilities? Yeah, I think we'd have to look at that. Um, you know, I think it's a little premature going that, down that because we'll see what kind of rollout. But so let me just say with the plan, how I see this coming forward is that we'll, we'll see what kind of units are recommended to be done get some cost and then figure out how we want to break that down. We want to break that down three, five years. If we want to get it all done at once and pay it off over three to five years. And that's really talking with, that's not independent of the school. I want to do that as a town discussion. It's their building. Uh, what's your building? Your town. But, you know, it's the, um, you know, but getting people involved. I think, you know, I've learned so far doing it as we did stuff at Frontier when we're transparent about how we're approaching projects, how we're paying for projects instead of, us coming and adding them jump in at the end instead of the beginning about how we do it. Um, you're right, though, it will probably increase electricity. Um, how much? I don't know. We can, we can look into that. Okay. And I, I had one more thing that I forgot. Um, I just want to mention that the PTO does a fundraiser in the fall to, um, it's with MCM. It's, it's pies and I can't remember cookie dough. And um, it's going to be starting on a Friday, October 1st, and it, we can accept orders for the two weeks, and they're due by the 15th. It's going to be online ordering again, and delivery will be in time for Thanksgiving on October 7th, uh, November 17th. 
that's a, a Wednesday. So just wanted Somebody to let everyone know, get ready to order pies. Get your, Somebody get should your put order that. ready, Bob. Huh? Get your order ready, Bob. <laughs> I'm just saying, maybe we should put that into the scoop too. The town scoop, the, the yeah. paper. Well, I think one just came out, right? So you get another three months before the next one. Comes yeah, out. it might. Yeah. Things have to get be way in advance, I think, to make it to that. They'd have to change the name of the paper to the town slice because it's pie. You know, it's scoops of pie. It's very complicated. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye.